confess that it does feel a little isolated, you know, not to be able to to say hello, to shake your hand and, you know, look into your eyes and say welcome to Grenfell campus. But, uh, you know, welcome everybody. We'll uh, have a chance at the end for questions. So, um, and I'll, I think we will skip just having to introduce everybody just uh, because of time. But when we open the floor for questions, you know, feel free to turn on your video and, uh, you know, show us your face and introduce yourself. But so today we're going to be talking about funding our, your graduate degree. And um, I will be sort of the main presenter. My name is Mary Perkins, and I work at Grenfell campus. For the past year, I was a postdoctoral research fellow. And recently I assumed a new role as coordinator of the Center for Research and Innovation. And I work very closely with Liana and Brady. And Brady is also uh, co-hosting this with me. And I'll let uh, Brady go ahead and introduce himself quickly. And he'll give you more background about himself in, in, in a little while. Yeah. Great. Um, glad everyone is here. And again, I share, I think, Mary's feelings that um, it's unfortunate we're not all together. Um, Grenfell is a very tight knit community. Um, and so we're trying to keep that feeling alive in this, you know, different way that we're doing things. Um, Leanna and I both recently graduated from master's programs at Grenfell campus and we're still around so obviously can you, you know back in the fall and see the latest near and dear to our heart so um Nate, i think you're Ooh. unmuted there you go <laughs> um you'll hear lots from Nada, so we don't need to hear from her right now um That's right. so it's yeah it's great to be here and like mary said she'll be sort of taking over uh most of the credit goes to mary for this presentation um, and she'll be taking the lead, but then if there's any questions, like I said, afterward, um, we're more than comfortable to, to provide an answer. Perfect. Thank you, Brady. All right. So uh, just a quick outline of what we'll uh, cover today. Uh, Brady and I will talk a little bit about ourselves and why we're doing this presentation. We also want to talk about, so why the question of funding? Some things may be very obvious and other things may not be as obvious. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I also want to talk about what types of funding sources are out there for you and um, very important. How do you build a strong application? And at the end, I'll be talking about some resources that you can tap into. This presentation is by no means exhaustive. Um, so you can expect sort of like an introduction through this presentation and we are available. So some of the links that, that I'll be giving you um, will give you like a lot more information, but also uh, Liana, Brady, and myself are available to to help you with at any point. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to follow up with us. So, so what do we what do Brady and I bring to this uh, presentation? So, as I mentioned, my name is Mary, and I actually moved here from the University of Guelph, actually from Ontario. I finished my PhD in Guelph, and my PhD was in rural studies. Hence, the reason why I'm in Newfoundland, a province with you know. Uh, an, an extremely large rural population. And throughout my my academic life, I I held a number of awards and scholarships. And one of the main lessons that I learned, you know, navigating my degrees was that a lot of people like forget or are not aware of the fact that there are awards and scholarships out there and hardly anybody applies. So very often um, I found myself being the only applicant to a funding uh, pocket of money and therefore I got it, right? So I, I, I managed to strategize a lot of that and I did access to quite a bit of funding throughout my, my academic life. Um, among those, I believe probably the, the most um, sort of sought after um, scholarship was the Shirk Doctoral Scholarship. And that's actually a very good source of funding that gives you up to, I believe it's $20,000 a year for three years. And it is such a such an important scholarship that a lot of people apply for it. I applied three times and I will come back to this idea. The first two times I was denied, I was declined and I was successful the last time I applied for it. So um, I bring that up so that you keep that idea in mind that sometimes you may not be successful, but you need to just keep trying and um, and you will see results. And finally, I also worked uh, 
for a nonprofit organization. So that experience uh, in, the, in that context gave me a lot of opportunity to apply for arts related money. So um, if there are any fine arts uh, graduate students here, um, I hopefully will be able to speak to some of your, your experiences and some of what you will need to keep an eye on because uh, applying for funds for the fine arts is slightly different, obviously, uh, than if you were applying for science uh, funding uh, and whatnot. So I will hand it over to Brady to introduce himself. Great, yeah, so um, Mary and I have been working together a lot over the last year um, and we've sort of swapped places. So I just finished my master's um, in the MAP program at Grimple Campus, which some of you uh, may be registered in. Um, and so if anyone on the call is in that program and has specific program related questions. I'm also available if they, you know, were recently finished that. Um, and then I'm actually studying at the University of Guelph in the same program Mary completed um, in the rural studies program. Still living in Newfoundland, um, obviously with COVID going on, it was uh, made more sense for me to move back home here in Newfoundland, it's where I'm from originally. Um, and so I'm doing the whole distance uh, thing like everyone is here. So I, I'm on both sides of the coin, I understand the struggle that you're trying to to start your graduate degree and um, at a distance may not be the easiest thing. So doing things like this, I think keeping active in the online, um, you know, going to presentations and, and getting your your face known and, and speaking at, at certain events is uh, hopefully going to help bridge that that uh, distance a bit until hopefully we can get you here in uh, January of this year. Um, so I'm also a recipient of the Shirk Award. And so we'll talk a bit about it later, but there are the, essentially the government has a agency, tri-agency that uh, allows for people to apply for funding through that. Um, and that's sort of like Mary said, the, the most sought after awards that provide um, some good funding for students um, and master's students as well. <clears throat> and um, I've also had sort of varied experiences in funding applications, both successful and very unsuccessful uh, attempts at funding applications. So it's, uh, as Mary said, there's this, you know, try and try again uh, mantra that you have to sort of adopt when you're applying for funding, because sometimes there may be a very simple reason why it didn't go through for you and, and not to feel discouraged about that. So um, I've been on both ends of the failure and the success of funding applications. So, um, um, and I think that for me, the biggest thing is Again, to echo what Mary said, you know, there's so many opportunities for funding and you may not think that, you know, well, I'm not going to put my application in for this. That doesn't really relate. Or, and to me, there's always a way you can spin what you're doing to match sort of the criteria of a funding application or to, to sort of fit with um, a scholarship application that you can sort of spin. So there's always opportunities out there and to never stop because sometimes you don't realize what a few extra thousand dollars or $500 here and there can do um, can do for your graduate experience, especially if you're trying to, you know, if you're working part time, for example, or doing other things that can really alleviate some of that. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Brady. Okay, so I want to ask you all a question before we move forward. So why would you apply for funding? Maybe you, you think that the answer is obvious. And if it is obvious, just shout it, shout it out. You can unmute yourselves and Tell me, so why should we worry about applying for funding? Any brave souls out there? Okay, I'll be brave. Yes. Um, <laughs> the obvious is to reduce your costs through your program, mm -hmm. um, but it's also about building your CV. Okay, I feel like you've read my slides because that's exactly what I was gonna say. Thank you, Sydney, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, yes, there is an obvious financial stability question here. So you are, as Brady said, maybe a lot of you are working part time. Um, and, you know, the costs of, you know, getting an education are not uh, small. And uh, if you have a family, you add to that stress as well. So there's an obvious financial stability, but also it really builds your CV. So oddly enough, when people see that in your CV that you're including that People wanted to give you money to study or to do your research. They want to give you more money and it seems counterintuitive, right? But um, the moment you get a shirk grant on your CV or the moment you get 
like a, a dean's award or something uh your cv becomes more attractive so you want to be building that for sure so the first thing i want to talk about is so what kind of funding sources are there um, available for you so um the first category would be what are called internal sources so things that are internal to the university and usually these sources are divided so some of them are available to domestic students only others are available to international students only and others are available to all um, all students there are some uh, school of graduate studies fellowships there are also graduate assistantships, so that's employment, and those are the things that NADA posts, and you apply to them, and uh, you get assigned to, to work with a particular researcher or professor, and you are part of that research project. Um, also, your supervisor may have a grant uh, or a contract that they can support you through. Uh, there are also special initiatives funding that are advertised through, uh, through the university website. There are also external sources, and the big ones that we've mentioned are the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or, or SHRC. There's also the Canadian Institute of Health Research, if you're uh, studying nursing or anything health-related. And there's the National Science and Engineering Council of Canada, and that's NSERC. So these three are often referred to as the Tri-Council uh, Awards. So again, these are you know, very sought after because they're highly prestigious and, um, you know, needless to say, they give you a lot of um, financial uh, stability and comfort. And finally, there are other foundations and funds out there that not everybody's aware of. And, um, you know, sometimes if you, you know, even the banks like Royal Bank, TD Bank and Scotiabank or whatnot, they have funds available for graduate studies and and it just takes a little bit of extra work and extra homework on, on your behalf to be sort of exploring what's out there. And a very handy tool that you will uh, hopefully become uh, well acquainted with is the, um, let me just change this. Uh, I don't know if I can, but anyhow. So the university has a, a website and I'm hoping, right? How can I go to my... I made my pointer a nice handy um, laser and I can't get myself to not be a laser anymore. Uh, anybody know the trick? I do not. Can you control click? Is that a? Let's see. It's not letting me. Hmm. What if you click on the little scribbly line on the toolbar? The scribbly line on the toolbar. Do you oh, have on that? The left. On the left? Of your screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to end the show. And start it again, and this should do it. Let's see. Yes. There we go. Can you see that? Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the searchable awards and scholarships database for the university. And what is really handy about this is that you can, you know, search if you know the type of award or the name of the award, you can search for it and it'll tell you, you know, when the due date is, it'll give you more of a write-up and uh, will if it has an external link. It would provide it there for you. You can search it by uh, status, you know, like, are you full time, part time? Um, are you a domestic student or are you an international student? What your degree is and, you know, it, it can get you can really use a lot of these filters and anything that you're eligible for would come up there for you. So let me go and get this uh, presentation started again. Let's see. There we go. Okay. And thank you, Lucas and uh, Brady. So there are, so when you look at the international student funding, there's a number of websites again that you can uh, go to. And there are some that are actually, the deadlines are coming up. So there is the International Development Research Council of Canada that if you are doing um, 
if your research involves um, a developing country, a lot of these uh, fundings would, uh, funding sources will be available for you. There's MyTax, uh, and for MyTax, usually that would go through your supervisor and they would need to get a, an industry partner to sort of uh, partially fund your, your award, but that's actually a, a really nice um, opportunity as well. And this link here would also be that uh, link that I just opened up. So an important thing that um, you must keep in mind as you begin your graduate life, uh, and I'm sure you are aware of this, deadlines are um, your, um, your guidelines. So any deadline, so you're going to be submitting assignments, we need to keep an eye on deadlines. And the same is true for your awards and funding opportunities. So if you if you spot one that you want, you want to aim for it, you know, keep a calendar, throw that date on that calendar and, and work backwards. And I cannot tell you enough what an important skill that is, you know, that you organize uh, your time, you keep an eye on those uh, important dates and you aim for them. And having said that, there are a few deadlines coming up. So those of you doing international research, the IDRC Research Awards, the deadline is September 16th, and there's a few coming up for the Tri-Council Awards, December 1st. Um, the SHRC doctoral programs are on the 17th of October, and there's another one coming up for the Affinity NL Scholarship, that's October 31st. So if any of those are of interest to you, you know, make sure you're aiming for those deadlines. And always give yourself more time than you think you'll need. And that is true not only for the awards, but also for your for your assignments. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Okay, we're good. So question. Yes, go ahead. Hey, yeah, my name is Diane Orefo. Um I have a question in regards to those students that have already been given um full scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, are they still eligible for more scholarship? Um, I, as far, maybe Liana or Brady, what do you think? Diane or Refo is my name. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. My question here, did you hear my question or yes. you want me to repeat? Yeah. Yes, I you got have... it. I got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I think Brady, Brady can answer that. Yeah, I think, and maybe can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there's sort of baseline funding that Memorial graduate students get um, that covers tuition and some uh, and some other things, uh, which is maybe what you're referring to, Diane. And um, there's absolutely more room for other applications to be sent in um, for other funding, um, especially if you're doing field work, if you have to travel for your research, or if you have to mm -hmm. do other activities that may cost a bit extra so that you're not paying out of your pocket, you can put in these applications that will help um, support you through those activities as well. Yes, definitely. So I know, Diane, that there are some um, sources of funding, like the International Develop Development Research Council of Canada, the RDRC, because it's such a such a big fund. So I think it's between forty thousand dollars to fifty thousand a year. I know that that one doesn't let you receive any other funding, right, from other sources. But when when a fund is when a fund works like that. I think you can you can decline other funding. You can basically make a choice as to which one will provide you uh, a better and more stable source of uh, of income and funding. But um, yes, as Brady said, as far as I understand, you have your basic funding, but it is it is basic, right? You you still need a little bit more to live comfortably. So it is. I believe the university is uh, generally open uh, that you know and assumes that you will go out and and look for more funding. And maybe Neda, you can correct us if we're wrong. Well, I, that's what I was just going to say. There is a cap, so depending on which type of external funding or additional funding you get, there will be a cap on your baseline funding. So that, um, and I don't have the the numbers right in front of me right now, but there's only a certain amount of external funding that you could to get that it doesn't interfere with your baseline funding. So it gets recalculated through the School of Graduate Studies. Uh, but once your external funding stops, your baseline would be reinitiated. So, there's, okay. and, and yeah, that's a case by case basis kind of thing. Okay. But my Thank advice you. would Thank be you. to just apply for everything and anything, and then um, once you get 
if you get accept acceptances or denials, you can decide then um, the best strategy for your particular um, mm -hmm. need. Yep, definitely yeah. agree there. Okay. And Colin, yeah, my... I don't know if I saw Colin unmute. I don't know if you had a question or. Yeah, uh, my second question will oh, be sorry. how do we know where we're getting our fundings? Like, if you're giving fundings, um, how do you know where the funds are coming from? Well, it, it, if you apply for a, so the baseline funding um, is directly through Memorial University through Grenfell Campus, I believe. Um, and then any additional funding you apply for is through a specific institution or foundation or um, body. So you would know when you apply for that fund um, where that money is coming from. Um, and yeah, so whoever you apply with, that would be where the money comes from. And Nate, I don't, know, I don't know if you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, Diane, I'm not sure if you're you're being more specific in regards to where your current, like every student that applies to both programs have been offered a financial package to start their program. That amount that you're being offered is, is made up of several different components from different funds. Um, you'll have your SGS baseline, then you'll have some graduate assistantships, or even some students may have supervisor funding. So there's a host of variety, you know, there's several different funds where we draw your funding package from. And if you need more details on that specifically, that's something you can send me an email and I can certainly answer your question in regards to the specifics of each individual student. Thank you. Thanks, Nada. Okay. Great. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, again, very general terms, like how do you build strong applications? In this section, I am basing uh, this part of the presentation on what I know that the tri Council um, awards look for. And again, I based it on SHRC because I'm, you know, my studies was in social sciences, but if you were in, in the science, natural sciences or math, like Lucas, or fine arts, it's going to be very similar what, what they're going to be looking for. So keep in mind that anybody who wants to give money to students, they want to give financial support to high caliber scholars. So people who have uh, sort of, who present a promising picture when it comes to research. And you need to keep in mind what you're eligible for, as we have mentioned. So they, again, the support allows you to fully concentrate on your studies, and builds your CV, as we have mentioned, but you need to, again, check on that eligibility. And usually there are three things that anybody who reviews your funding application is looking for. And I've created this simple little chart here that has all the components. So the first thing they're going to be looking at is your academic excellence, and I'll take that apart in a minute. They also want to be looking at your research potential, and finally, your personal skills, and hopefully that gets you some money. So let's take that apart for a minute. So the first thing that I mentioned was academic excellence. And I believe that the um, there is actually a, a percentage in a table that, you know, they assign you a certain percentage to, to this, you know, the category of academic excellence. And I believe academic excellence is the second most important. The first, like the most important one would be your research proposal. but when it comes to academic excellence, uh, so why are they looking at you know your grades or your own history? Well, they they want to know how credible you are based on your past history and how credible it is that you will actually do this research. So they're going to be looking at your academic records. So again, unfortunately, they do look at grades. Um, they look at whether you held scholarships and awards in the past. As I mentioned, you know when somebody sees you know this person received an award, you know, when they, when they finished high school or uh, when they entered university. They also want to see how long it took you to finish your previous studies. So like if you're a master's student, they will see, you know, did it take you, you know, 10 years to finish uh, or seven years? And there is allowance for a personal situations. So, and, and again, most applications will allow you to to uh, explain any circumstances that delayed your studies, but they want to see, you know, a, a pretty straightforward line. 
they also want to see what type of programs and courses you you pursued, right? Were they relevant? Were they did they look rigorous and challenging? How many courses did you take? And again, this is also um, there's room for flexibility there as well. You know, a, a funding application would look at you know whether you had a health concern or whether you are a parent and that delayed your application. I'm sorry, your your studies. And finally, they want to see how you compare to other people. The other piece uh, that they're looking at is your research potential. So the actual research proposal. And why are they looking at that? Well, they need to they need to prove that the project is actually doable. And how do they do that? So they look at, you know, what is your own research history? What are your interests? And you know, what does the proposal look like? And what's the contribution that that proposal will make to to knowledge, basically. So what's the quality and is it original? Is it an original contribution or does it look like, you know, this is something anybody has done in the past? Is the work relevant and uh, is it relevant to the academic program that you're uh, undertaking? Is it, um, is it possible, is it feasible and uh, is it a proposal that, that has merit, right? Is it something that, you know, is it innovative? And uh, they will also be looking at um, whether you yourself um, are showing in this proposal that you you can think critically and that you can transfer that knowledge onto onto real life. And finally, they'll look at your ability to apply these skills and knowledge and your own initiative and experience. And finally, they are going to look at your own personal characteristics and interpersonal skills. And why do they do that? Well, they want to make sure that the person who's leading this project is a capable project manager. So when you look at a, a research project, uh, you are looking in summary at a, at a project, right? So it is a project that you will need to manage and they need to, whoever's funding you, wants to know that you have the working leadership experience to do that, to, to manage that project uh, so how do they how do they judge that? Well, they want to see whether you have project management experience, um, whether you've attended conferences, have you have you been to meetings, have you managed your time wisely, have you have you managed different uh, projects in different contexts, not only in research but your different jobs that you have held. Um, they also want to see if you're able to communicate the theoretical knowledge and concepts in a, whether it's written or verbally. They want to see how involved you have been in, in your academic life and they want to see whether you've been involved in your community. So have you been a, a volunteer? Have, have you been involved in community outreach? So again, that uh, those elements in ACV will enforce this idea that you have the personal characteristics to manage a, a large project or a project that requires commitment over time. Okay. Any questions about that? The three things that they're looking for. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, some practical uh, pieces of advice. So first of all, any fine arts uh, graduate students out there? Um, I'm here. Yes. I'm Good, sorry. I can to... unmute my microphone, but I did yeah. have a question. Go for it. Yes. So um, what if I guess this is on a personal level, but I'm sure it applies to a lot of people. What if a lot of what you accomplished is not necessarily good in academic terms? Like if the world right now is very focused on like the BLM movement and what if you organized a lot in the BLM movement? Like, is there a way you can put that on your CV so it impresses scholars, even though it's not academia? Absolutely, absolutely. And I know like Brady and, and I, you know, Leanna, if you have anything to add, but I would say, that any any work that we do outside of academia is transferable and the, and the opposite is also true right so when you when you are applying for funding or when you create a cv and somebody sees that you've been involved in your community that you've managed people or that you've been involved with people and that you've you made these commitments absolutely this will strengthen your cv and it will you know make you look um uh, credible again you know you are you're somebody who's who's involved in the community, who's who's been in invest, who's invested their time into into projects. So, um, 
even though other people may disagree, but I, my general understanding and Brady and Deanna and Nada, you can correct me and or anybody else out there, Luke, because I know you're on uh, this call as well. But I think there is so much value in in the jobs that we held or in the community involvement that we that we find ourselves in. And don't be shy about how you communicate that in a CV because it is relevant. In yeah. Else. I just want to add, I think um, one of the things that I've learned, at least in the last year, um, is that almost anything can go on a CV. Um, there is uh, ways to, and I think, I'm not sure if that's on the schedule currently, I'm sure at some point there will be some professional development sessions on building CVs. Um, but I think it's really a exercise in sort of our, our own personal, um, you know, there's sort of standard ways you can put a CV together, but then it's also a reflection of, you know, the work you've done and the work and the things that you've put, you know, put out there. Um, and so sometimes I like to think of, you know, building your CV as a very personal activity and that, you know, you can follow certain guidelines and certain structures and certain things, but really it has to come down to eventually, you know, what you've done and, and making sure that you're comfortable with how you're presenting the information. Um, and there really is, you know, like I said, very little things you can't put on the CV. Um, and like I said, I think you can spin almost anything in a certain way to make it look, you know, like something, because I, I think that, you know, the skills that we gain don't always come from reading a book or writing a paper or doing, you know, so um, showing how you have gained those skills and, and that you're competent in those different areas um, I think is really important as well, aside from just, you know, producing this or doing this. So, yeah. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, I agree completely. I think that there's lots of ways to kind of package your various experiences. When you're writing grant applications, um, sometimes there'll be CV forms that are a bit limiting. So for example, the Shirk CV looks at work experience, it may not have a section for volunteer experience. Um, but if you're writing up your own CV in a Word document or something, there's lots of different ways to package it. So you can, you know, you can do work experience versus volunteer experience do leadership experience, you can do other professional experience, depending on the role that you held in whatever organization or activity you were working on. Um, but it's definitely an important thing to consider and include where you can. I agree with everything. Maybe, um, like some things may not affect it uh, as much. And the one thing specifically in my case, I'm involved with the Green Party of Canada. And so if I'm applying to an application where uh... Is it just me or is Lucas no, I think it's, freezing up? I think it's Lucas Lucas is freezing up. Yeah, I'm not sure where he is to make his connection, but he's completely frozen. Yeah, slowly moving and slowly. <laughs> Lucas, can you hear us? Maybe not. Lucas? Um, I think, but I think I understand what he was saying is that there are certain things like you can, you have a range of things you've done and then there's certain things that um, for a specific application, for example, you may not include this in that application or you may include this in a different application or, you know, so it's really about designing each, you know, each, not necessarily one CV for all applications. You know what I mean? It's going to be personalized depending on what the funding partner is looking for. Um, and so really it's about creating that, like I said, spinning your experience in a way for whatever application it is you're, you're looking to put together. Yes. Yeah. Lucas, is it, is it any better? <laughs> He's still like I know he has, I know. I know. So I would say, I know he probably has uh, something really valuable to add. So if maybe somebody can text him and let him know, yeah. and then he could probably put it as a comment and we'll, we'll read it out loud. Yep. Okay. Yeah. We can't hear you at all now. Yeah. He just responded to me. He's in the middle of nowhere right now. So his internet is not very good. Okay. 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 All right. I'll text him and tell him to put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you for that question. I think it was Kellyanne, I believe. And um, so 
let me talk a little bit really briefly uh, to what you need to keep in mind if you're writing within the fine arts. So anybody who's thinking of applying for fine arts funding, whenever we talk about your academic credibility, so I talked to you, you know, about your grades and academic credibility, but when you're thinking about yourself writing for fine arts funding, your academic credibility is really your artistic credibility and your artistic potential. So how do you rate as an artist or as a potential um, professional artist? That background as an artist is going to be important. And as an artist, you're going to show your capacities by the work that you have done and by you know, the exhibits or again, your, your community involvement through the arts is going to be very important. Also, when you're applying for funding, it's important to de define your discipline. So are you a, you know, are you a visual artist? What's your, what's your medium? What is it that you focus on? Or maybe you're interdisciplinary and you wanna make sure you, you define that. If you haven't defined that yet, you will define that as you go through your, um, your, your experience at Grenfell. Again, you're going to need to clarify your project idea. It has to remember your projects have to be clear and to the point and when you're writing that proposal, you're no, you need to, you know, keep in mind what the the proposed like the, the project itself is. What are the outcomes that you expect? There are five W questions that you need to always answer: the who, who's going to be in the project, what form will it take, what will be involved, so what what are you going to be doing, where are you going to be doing this, and uh, how, and finally. Why are you doing it? Why is it important? Why should somebody uh, bother and, and give you money for this? And I believe we will be sharing this, this slide uh, deck and there is a link here for, it's actually um, an arts grant, uh, arts grant writing handbook that I found, I used to find really helpful when I was applying for funding for community um, arts uh, projects. So you can access that to this link. If you're writing for the social sciences or the natural sciences, again, your proposal is going to be focused on things such as what's the problem that you're addressing? So there's obviously whether it's a science related project or a social problem, what is it that you're trying to, to fix, so to speak, or address? What are your research questions? So make sure that, and I always talk about this and, and Brady knows why, when I, when I was doing my, my, my PhD, there came a point when I was, you know, thinking about what I was doing and I said to myself, I don't think I know what I'm asking, right? So make sure that when you sit down to write that proposal that you, you set out to start your research, that you know the questions that you're asking. So what are you looking to answer? And those questions need to be connected to that problem that you're addressing. Another very, very important piece is and make sure you explain your methodology. So how are you how are you planning to collect your data? How are you going to analyze it? And you, you need to be as detailed as you can be. The idea with a research project is that somebody sh technically should be able to read your methodology and replicate the research, right? So somebody should be able to do exactly what you did and hopefully find similar results when it comes to uh, you know, research, there are exceptions, but that's the idea. Somebody should be able to read your methodology and understand exactly what you did step by step. And that is there so that you also prove that you actually used a systematic approach to research and that your research was uh, high quality. Again, when you're writing a proposal, it needs to be focused and you need to convey that you have thought about this. You're not just whipping it together, but you've actually thought about it and you're making an educated proposal. And finally, proofread. You know, when you start writing this, and that's why the deadlines are important, start writing early so that you have time to proofread and, you know, it, make sure you, you give it to somebody that you trust so that they proofread it for you as well. So some other tips to keep in mind when you're writing, never sell yourself short or your project short, you know, be confident and believe that what you're doing is going to be important and um, write confidently, like you know what you're doing and like you have what it takes to take the, to get this project done. Um, last year, we had this 
um, it was called the three minute thesis competition. And I, you know, maybe some of you have been involved in a Brentford campus, the guy who won first place, um, he, I think he won because he made this statement at the very beginning. He said, you know, my research is brilliant. I am breaking new ground. I am making a unique contribution. And then he went on to, to talk about what he was doing. And the judges picked up on that. So make sure that you're, you're not selling yourself short and uh, that you're, you believe in the project and that you believe in your abilities to, to do the project. And so when you're writing, again, be confident. There are two ways to write. You could be, you could write passively. For example, you could say, you know, we hope this project can beautify this currently underutilized space. And uh, we hope that this happens. Well, that's a little passive. You wanna be more aggressive and you could say, this project will beautify this currently underutilized green space, right? So this project will do this, not I'm hoping to do this, right? You wanna, you wanna be confident. And my last big piece of advice is get involved. I know that it's hard right now, you know, as being online, uh, not being on campus, not being able to gather physically, but you will still find opportunities to get involved. And for now, it's going to have to be online, but the world will change again and we will find ourselves with more opportunities, but get involved whenever you get an email from NADA or anybody else uh, on campus, you know, asking for volunteers, you know, make sure you, you um, manage your time wisely. But uh, if you can get involved, you know, if there are opportunities to present, do it, you know, connect to other people, volunteer, volunteer on campus and beyond campus when you're able to, because those are the opportunities that will uh, build your CV, will open up funding opportunities for yourself. And, and that's how, that's how you build your career. You, you connect with others, you volunteer, you get involved. And also it makes your experience more positive. So in summary, when we look at funding applications to, to be writing strongly, strong funding applications, you need to think of the three things. So first of all, your excellence. Your, so like the excellence in your research and your art practice, your potential. So you make sure that you show that your research has potential, that you have potential and your personal skills. So what is your own past history, what have you done in the past? How have you been involved? And I see surrounding this whole, this three sort of part um, conceptualization is surrounded by persistence. So don't give up, keep applying, keep writing, keep building your CV because you know chances are you, you will not get everything that you apply for, but you will get some of what you apply for. So don't give up, keep trying and you know reach out to us we have a lot of people on campus who are here to support you and you know i know that i can speak for liana and brady and nada we love um helping we love you know connecting with you and that's why we are here there are a couple of additional websites that i have uh on the last slide here and also again reach out to us liana is a grants and awards facilitator right now there is um, another person coming back. Uh, her name is Jennifer Butler White, so she's also available. That's my email address, uh, empress at grenfell.mon.ca. Brady is also around and available, and Nada is also uh, there for you. And if there is something Nada can't help you with, she will uh, find the right person to connect you with. Mm -hmm. So, um, any other additional comments from Brady, Liana, Nada, Lucas, or any questions? Go for it. Um yeah and if i just to just to end there it, nada put her email in the chat and i would highly recommend putting that in your speed dial having a sticky note making sure you memorize that email because that's one of the um, most frequent emails you may be sending questions to um if not ourselves mary or or liana so the other thing is you know on the support piece you've also got your supervisors who um are great and if uh there's any sort of if you see an award and you're wondering, I don't know if I'm eligible for this, or I don't know if this makes sense for me to apply to, um, always check with your supervisor. They will either have encountered the award before, maybe have applied for it themselves at one point, so they have a better idea of your specific project and, and how that would fit. Um, and then always, you know, I would say quite assertively hound on your supervisors to be giving you 
um, if they come across an award or if there's something that they see, like make sure that they know you're interested in applying for awards. So that if they if they see something or they think there's a funding opportunity that would fit with the project, um, they can pass it along to you to apply for. And that way you're sort of getting the most opportunity um, to put these applications together. And what you'll notice over time is if, especially, you know, as you, as you build your project and you start to figure out sort of the ins and outs of that, um, every application obviously will be different, but there's a lot that will be, you know, if you can write a nice strong um, application for the first few, then oftentimes those are very transferable to the others. So it's not necessarily going to take you as long to put together applications in the, in the future. So a really good point of contact first off is your supervisor um, who would help support that. And then, like I said, if, if they think it's a good idea, you can reach out to us and we can help um, actually in putting together. Um, or, and another thing is really to get people to review. It's always helpful to have a second pair or third pair of eyes on your application. So for people to look it over, um, again, your supervisor will likely be doing this if you're applying for an award, but also peers um, and other people at the university are great just to read it over and make sure that you're not missing anything here and there as well. Liana or Neda or Lucas, anything? Yeah, I um, I totally agree with what Brady was just saying. I think it helps a lot to have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of or who can review your proposal. And, you know, if somebody reviews your proposal and gets an idea of what you're trying to do and can summarize it back to you, you've probably done a pretty good job. Um, I'd also encourage you to look um, at funder criteria. Sometimes if you're applying to a specific award, um, there'll be kind of like a merit template. So kind of a breakdown of what exactly they're looking for with percentages and weightings. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be really helpful as well when you're, so you know how much to focus on your own excellence versus the merit of the proposal versus all the other things that are taken into account. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think you've summarized everything really well, Mary. Thanks. And I will share, I'll send the um, slide deck to Nada. Nada, and maybe you could forward that to all that registered or make it available? Yep, absolutely. It's probably something that we'll post on our grad studies website. Perfect. Uh, so that it'll be accessible to all of our sure. students. Yep. Okay. Did anybody have any questions? About anything and everything. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yes. So I'm Clinton. Um, I received funding for the BES program, the BES program. But my question has to do with how I'm going to pay my fees because currently international borders in my home country are closed. And I never sent me. I'm not so sure. I just want to know how I'm going to pay my fees since I'm still in my home country. Yeah. So that's a question, um, Clinton, that you and I can probably discuss that separately. So if you want to send me an email, um, we can kind of have a discussion outside of here um, and I can address your concerns. Okay, sure. Thanks. Any other questions? Too bad we can do like a you know raise hands question. So how many of you are are um, like in in Canada? And like how many of you are are still hoping to come to uh, Cornerbrook in the near future? Uh, I actually had a question about coming yes. to Corner Brook right mm -hmm. now. I wanted to move there prior to the winter uh, to really get the most out of like a fine arts experience. You need a studio and such. So I was wondering, are there like restrictions on going to Newfoundland right now? Like you can't just go there right now. So my understanding is that if you are moving to Newfoundland, and you have, and you can prove it. So, you know, your letter of acceptance or like a, a signed lease or something like that, they'll let you come in. Like they, 
as far as I understand. And again, I would check like the government of Newfoundland website, but as, as far as I understand, they let you come in if you're moving. And uh, obviously when you arrive, they'll make you uh, isolate for 14 days. And they're pretty strict about it. They do check up on you. Uh, but as far as I understand, you can, you can move. And you, like, Brady, I know you've done the move since COVID started, right? But, but you, yeah, you so, from here, so. Yeah, so if you, um, you can travel, I'm not sure where it is you're traveling from, but um, if you come back and like you said, if you show that you're moving to Newfoundland um, as a student, then if you're in Canada already, you are able to um, come in and then you'd have to isolate uh, for 14 days when you arrive. Um, and there are, you know, that might sound a bit daunting, and I understand that it's very difficult to do that for 14 days, um, but there are sort of services that um, public health is, is you know, checks up on you um, sometimes, and as well, you know, as part of the Grenfell community, there's always a way to reach out and people can, um, you know, help and bring things by if they need to or whatever, but I think it, it is possible. Um, and it would just be um, a bit of legwork on your end to make sure that um, you're good to come in. And I think there's, they're coming out, I think every day is sort of a new update on how things are working. So, I mean, stay tuned over the next week or two, I think, as schools reopen. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think that's that's definitely possible. And, and like I said, if, if you want to reach out with any more questions, we can help um, help with that a bit. And I'll just reiterate what Brady just said in regards to moving here. Um, if you're obviously within our Atlantic bubble, um, you're good to go. But once you step outside of that bubble, once you arrive here in Newfoundland, you have to quarantine for two weeks. But I will say that Grenfell Campus is working hard to put every, all kinds of measures in place. Uh, we're here to help you and to certainly navigate these new waters as we you know take up this online learning or for those students who are actually going to be here in cornerbrook so if you have any questions regarding that certainly send myself an email and uh, i'll find out the correct information i see a question there from paige she says hi nada i have a question about student loans and grants are we encouraged to still apply for those even if we have funding Absolutely, yes, 100%. If, you, if you're coming to Grenfell with a funding package, you're still encouraged to certainly apply for, um, you know, any scholarships that are available and that you meet the criteria. Lucas, Neil, you need groceries next week? We'll see what we can do for you. <laughs> yeah, how does, how does that work? Like, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to getting down there, you know, and uh, uh, same as, sorry, was it Kellyanne who was speaking before? Mm -hmm. She, yeah. you know, I, when I get there, we'll have to self-isolate for two weeks. So it's like, how do you, how? I haven't had to do that yet. Right. It's a, it's, I mean, it's a bit tricky. Everyone, you know, goes through it a bit differently. I mean, it's really, um, you know, you have to stay on your property. So if you're in a, an apartment or if you're on, on campus, I'm not sure exactly how they do it in residence if you're in residence. Um, but it's, you know, it can certainly be, a, you know, a lonely experience for sure. Um, yeah. And then, it, you know, hopefully, but then once you're here after the two weeks, um, you know, as long as we stay in the state that we're in now and no active cases and um, after the two weeks, then we can, you know, hiking yeah. and do other things outdoors yes. and yeah. and get together yeah. and you know in a, in a safe way obviously but you know there are things that we can do um yes. if people and unfortunately there are you know uh for international students it's it's a lot different and and that's you know, unfortunate um but yeah, yeah. the two week the two week self quarantine is it, it like applies to any anybody arriving from outside of atlantic canada right so mm -hmm. even outside of Can outside of canada also uh, but also, like, if you are on campus, I think you have a little bit more support. But if you're living off campus, you can, um, you know, order groceries online and they'll deliver them to your door. I, I okay. actually had traveled to Ontario and when I came back, I, I, I did that. So, you know, you are, you're fine. Like, there are, <laughs> there's a lot that you can actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I've been, you know, like everybody else basically staying at home, but. My mom, I moved back here. She's got a large property and I've 
been spending lots of time outside and we're, we have to find a place now again or whatever when we go down there. So I'm not quite sure what that'll look like. But I was just kind of yeah. curious. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. It is so, good. so yeah, Sydney, ahead. I just see your question there. You asked, is the Cornerbrook Superstore doing delivery? Alberta. Well, the Cornerbrook Superstore right now, our version of the Superstore is Dominion. And unfortunately, Dominion is currently on strike here. Yeah. Yeah. But we have several other grocery stores in town that will do delivery. So that's yes. an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhat unrelated, but do we know when the school is expecting to decide about in-person classes for the winter semester? Um, I haven't heard anything yet. Everything is evolving on a day-to-day -day basis and constantly changing. So when we know, you will know. And we are looking forward to seeing all of you. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so if there are no um, additional questions, like we are good to go, Nada. I believe you have more events and more um, presentations coming up, I believe. Yes, so everybody need to keep an eye on the uh, the orientation webpage. It's now fully up and functioning. The schedule is there. Um, so I encourage you to make sure you're aware of the events that are happening. Um, and uh, like Mary just said, we, we can't wait till we can, you know, get you here on campus. And you get to meet. We get to meet you face to face. It'll be, it'll be an awesome time for sure. Yes. All right, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Thank you, Mary. Once Thank again, you. Thank, you, Thank you, Leanna. You. Guys, this is great. I just Bye. attached the link for orientation, just in case anybody is missing it. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome.